Welcome to the Thundercast, your martial athletics podcast produced by the fans, for the fans, with your hosts, Russ Livingood and KD Hudnall. We're bringing you the thundering word on the thundering herd each and every week. So keep it right here. The Thundercast is on the loose. Thanks for downloading another episode of the Thundercast. You can follow us on Twitter at Thundercast underscore pod. Russ, we've got a uh, pretty exciting bit of news that we have to talk about. We know the herd's going bowling. We found out bowl destination and the opponent just uh, yesterday as we record. Um, what is today? I forget what day it is. Anyway, whatever evening it is. I don't know. I lose track of my days, as you know. Um, and there's some news around the uh, football program as far as coaching hire goes, and I'm sure we're going to get into all that. But let's uh, go ahead and get a quick word from our sponsors at 304carrec.com. If you've been injured in a car wreck, visit 304carwreck.com on the web or on Facebook. What happens when an Ohio driver crashes into a West Virginia driver in Kentucky? That can be a mess. But if you can dream it up, Jason and Matt have probably been there, done that, and gotten their clients paid. Don't fight the insurance companies alone. Contact Jason and Matt at 304carwreck.com. Big week. We know a lot of positivity came out. And uh, it's award season, and there, you know, that means uh, a lot of people are being recognized across more than just one sport. I'm sure we're going to be including a bunch of that. So, with that being said, let me get at least maybe five things that every herd fan needs to know this week. Well, why don't we do eight things oh. every herd fan needs to know this <laughs> week? As always, brought to you by Ignite Link, the Tri State's premier IT management team. I'm going to start off number one. We can confirm. Seth Dagey has been named the offensive coordinator slash quarterback coach, as was first rumored by footballscoop.com. Yep, that is true. Uh, that story broke, I don't know, just maybe yesterday, and it started swirling around, yeah. and, and yeah. people were, ah, I can't really believe it. I don't know this. And, you, you know, you can't. It, there's a lot of stuff that goes up. But Football Scoop sure. is generally sure. pretty reliable. Mm -hmm. So um, I took that for – more than just a grain of salt. You know, you can put mm -hmm. a little bit behind that. So then today, right, uh, you know, about kind of before we got going here, I, I looked and, oh, well, the profile has changed. You know, it's it's a, a herd logo in the, in the X profile, Twitter profile, whatever. Uh, the uh, bio has been updated to reflect offensive coordinator slash quarterbacks coach for herd football location says Huntington, West Virginia. I think that's enough arrows. <laughs> I think that's enough dots that we can now draw a line from West Lafayette, Indiana to Huntington, West Virginia. So first of all, we know who our guy is. I guess we can say welcome to the herd. Um, Seth Dagey, pretty young guy, 34 years old. Uh, he's got a, I guess it's a, it's, it's a pretty short coaching career to make it to this point if you want to look at it that way. Uh, he played for Texas Tech, so we know what type of offense Texas Tech is known for. Uh, he's mm -hmm. had several big stops at um, big-time FBS schools in an analyst role, but the whole thing started for him in a coaching scenario as a GA um, at Bowling Green. You know, and, and Bowling Green and the Daggies kind of go hand in hand because Seth's brother, Jarrett Daggy was an outstanding quarterback at Bowling Green and then made several portal moves where he went to WVU and a cup of coffee at Western Kentucky and then down to Troy. And, you know, but it was Bowling Green where he had the most success as a quarterback. So it's not surprising to see a Daggy uh, start at Bowling Green. But from Bowling Green in 2019, he gets hired by USC as an offensive quality control analyst when the head coach of Bowling Green went to join staff uh, in L.A. Then in 2022, hired by Lane Kiffin at Old Miss to be an offensive analyst. And then this year, this past season, 2023, was in his first season as the Purdue tight end coach. And I was reading some, you know, kind of Purdue fan blog type things that were that are, were talking about the hire uh, and him going to Marshall saying like they were really um, kind of excited to potentially have him back for 2024 because the tight end unit was one of the best that they had going mm -hmm. in West Lafayette. So um, he's never been a 
FBS coordinator before, never been a play caller before. Now we don't know if he will handle play calling duties. You just assume that your offensive coordinator will. Um, I don't know what that means. I don't really care what that means, right? Because uh, this is, I guess you got to call it what it is. This is a make or break season for Coach Huff, right? He's entering the last year of his contract. There's no extension yet. And he's hi he's hired uh, Seth Dagey to be a first-time offensive coordinator, first-time play caller. He's got to see something that the regular fan doesn't, right? So, again, I'll yield to Coach Huff and his expertise before I make any type of uh, judgment because um, you've got to see something there if you're willing to, you know, take that kind of bet. So I'm 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 gonna take the bet with him and just be positive until I see otherwise. What do you what do you think about this hire of Seth Dagey? Real quick, cursory glances show that he has followed Graham Harrell a lot from you know, both of them are Texas Tech uh guys. And then uh I think maybe even quarterback there together, you know, in the same QB room. Uh, and then uh, he's kind of followed him around in coaching a little bit. And then from uh, one of his connections there at USC, he landed over at Ole Miss. Uh, so he got uh, um, under Lane Kiffin a little bit. He's had some tutelage under Mike Leach. So we're talking about some of the biggest offensive minds and like offense, 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 score, 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 put the ball down the field is kind of been the offenses that he's been in. Is that what everybody's been clamoring for? Yes. And, um, you know, people have to start somewhere, and I don't mind it being his first offensive coordinator role here. Well, you're right. And a lot of people are just immediately going to toss up the roadblock, like, well, he's never been a coordinator before. He's never been a play caller before. Well, I, I get it. There's a certain amount of, you know, viability to that argument. Mm -hmm. uh, but – you heard Huff in the uh, bowl announcement press conference, if you listen to it, say that he, he didn't allude to any coaching hires, right, of course, or mm -hmm. candidates or anything, because he just keeps everything mm -hmm. close to the vest. But he did say things like there's a lot of moving parts at play, and he mentioned things like resources, and um, you know it's got to be a good fit for not just the candidate, but also the family. Things are involved. You know, It's, it's a right, big yeah. thing. It's not just one guy makes a decision and – you kind of roll with it. So when you're at this level, I think we know now is the disparity amongst Power 5 money and G5 money just continues to grow wider and wider and wider. Uh, your resources are going to be a hindrance because we've been in the realm for a long time now where position coaches and coordinators at Power 5 schools can out-earn head coaches and often do – uh, at G5s. So you have to find the right guy who's willing to potentially just make a lateral move from a financial standpoint or maybe get a little bump in pay, but yeah. he's hungry for that opportunity, you know, because mm -hmm. you know that down the road, if this works out, the bigger paycheck is coming, the bigger opportunities mm -hmm. are coming. And you just have sure. to be okay with that. Yeah. I, people, for some reason, get angry that like, well, Marshall's a stepping stone school. Dude, every school in the country is a stepping stone school. And I'm going to throw it back. The best example that I can use, the best couple examples that I can use, are Brian Kelly left Notre Dame to go to LSU. Okay? But nobody's going to consider Notre Dame a, quote, stepping stone school. But that still happened. He left. Mm -hmm. He wasn't fired. He left Notre Dame and went to LSU. And also, Jimbo Fisher left Florida State. And went to Texas A and M. So you can't. You just got to get that out of your mindset. When in terms of Marshall, that's right. every school in the country. Lincoln Riley yeah. left Oklahoma to go to USC. Okay, so it's it's often about finding that next guy. This is no different than finding the next hot head coaching commodity, right? But it's just from a quarterbacking or a, a coordinator standpoint. So maybe you go out and find the next hot coordinator that is going to light the world on fire, and we see it all the time. So why not Marshall, right? Why not here? Why can't it happen here? Um, I think if – I don't know what type of offense that Seth is going to run, but if you're thinking, man, this is going to be a pass-heavy, air raid-ish type offense, that'll be a vast turnaround from what we've seen from Charles Huff coached teams. He's always relied on running the football and playing really good defense, and – I don't know. I don't know if this is going to be a transitional air raid type thing. That seems like a huge bet to make with, again, 
one year on the contract or entering the final contract year. So I don't know how it'll go, um, but you're always excited about a new hire and potentially bringing some new weapons with him. You know, uh, that's what you hope to see. I think with any uh, ho- coaching hire, as as especially in this portal era, and I did a little snooping yesterday. I was looking at the Purdue portal guys, and there's some weapons that are in there. There's some wide receivers and tight ends and a lot of linemen also. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see, man. It, it could be really interesting, but I think we can at least put to bed right now who the OC is. Now we get to wonder who the offensive line coach is going to be, who's the linebackers coach going to be, and who's the wide receivers coach going to be. But for now, this is going to be Seth Dagey in 2024 leading the way for the herd offense. Yeah, and I'm pure speculation on my part, KD, but uh, I don't see why we couldn't have elements of the air raid offense and some plays and formations and things. But, you know, you does, doesn't mean that you have to bring it in at all time. You know, you do a hybrid kind of an offense of what we were doing last year and into this year, and you can combine those. So you can have the – uh, RPO, you can have air raid, you can interchange some of these, you know, uh, you do have to find quarterbacks, receivers, running backs, and linemen, uh, the, and tight ends, of course, but that can run that, mm-hmm. you know, so, uh, you just got to make sure that your personnel, that your offense fits that and you can move the ball down the field. Yeah, I think what we're going to be looking for, hopefully, as fans, is to see some the creativity that you get in that air raid offense from a passing standpoint, while also maintaining what we have known to be a really strong Marshall ground game over the last three years since Huff has been here. So, a lot to be um, intrigued about for sure. Um, I would just ask that people, you know, not make that knee jerk reaction because we don't have any inkling of what this offense is going to look like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> with the f- literal first or second day on the job with the new OC. So give it a chance to go right or give it a chance to go wrong before you make your, you know, yourself known. Because already I was seeing people like, I hate the hire. Why? You don't know? We don't know. How, what do you hate? What, because we didn't go out and get the, uh, you know, the second coming of Bill Walsh. I mean, this could be it. We don't know. We don't have a clue. Just, I don't know. I, I Again, I choose to be positive in, in these circumstances because it's just easier. But anyway, I same. Number two, uh, we're looking at 12 individuals named to the all Sun Belt Conference teams. First team was defensive end Owen Porter, cornerback Micah, Micah Abraham, red, uh, return specialist, all, all-time CRS. I immediately, my brain goes red shirt. Um, oh, yeah. re- return specialist, Jaden Harrison. Uh, second team was running back Rasheen Ali. Third team was defensive lineman Elijah Alston. Offensive lineman Ethan Driscoll. Linebacker Eli Neal. Punter John McConnell. Honorable mention, we had uh, O-line Dalton Tucker. And Log- Logan Osborne. And then defensive lineman Sam Burton. And safety J.J. Roberts. 12 yep. on the individuals or on the uh, different teams. Yep, 12 guys across the all all of the all Sun Belt teams really cool. Um, I think a lot, I think some people are going to be surprised by that because you go, really, that many guys from a six and six team, dude. Have you looked at the Sun Belt standings? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this conference is a brutal conference, so yeah, your record is not always going to be indicative of how your individual players are playing because, damn, literally half of the conference. Went six and six. There's so much parity in the Sun Belt Conference, and you know, while in the grand scheme, I think it it, it may hinder you know that that uh, you know that national pub for the best couple of teams that come out of it. Troy has been basically untalked about through the mm-hmm. you know the yeah. uh, NY six slot. It's been Liberty and a yeah. little bit of SMU, and and Troy just kind of got jobbed in that whole conversation because they're yeah. really good. But they are really good. But it says this conference from top to bottom, any given Saturday, anybody can beat anybody. That's you know? right, man. And, and I think as a college football fan, that's where you want to be. Now, if you're one of those fans that's like, no, I want the path of least resistance to get to the playoff, I get that too because that paycheck would be really nice. But what that does is put pressure on these coaches and these programs to – just be far and away better. And if you can come out of the Sun Belt as a 12-win team, 
you know, or undefeated, you're probably going to be a lock for the playoff, right? Because you're undoubtedly going to be ranked higher than um, an American team or a, um, a Conference USA team. So I guess it's how you choose to view it. You know, it's tough. You know, I think a mm-hmm. lot of schools in this conference better get used to having that seven, eight win total when they're not used to having that because that probably mean eight, what's that? Eight and four. And they're, and they're in the conference title game, you yeah. know? So yeah. that just tells you, you know, eight wins can get you there. So a lot of times, you know, the conversation at Marshall is eight or the gate for our coaches. And I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I think you should be able to win eight games a year. I get it. And and I think uh, more often than not, we should be at that eight win threshold. We just should, you know, that should, that's a minimum expectation for me, you know, uh, but uh, that tells you that that can land you in a, in a Sunbelt conference title game. So dang, man, what a brutal conference, but to land 12, that says we got guys that can play. All right, we are moving on to number three. United Soccer Coaches has named the Marshall men's soccer staff as Southeast Region Staff of the Year. Uh, I mean, good for them. I, that's awesome. But um, we, we know we have a great staff. We know we have something yeah. special in Huntington. You know, and I think uh, I speak for them when I say they'd trade that in a heartbeat to still be playing in Louisville. You know? Oh, yeah. An, yeah. an accolade is great, but they want to be competing. And uh, – mm-hmm. But, th- you know, these little things like this, uh, they do help, you know, they, they help get your name out there again. They, they, you know, because remember, we had coaching turnover. We had guys leave, new guys come in. So to be able to, you know, weather that storm and still be considered the best in the Southeast region says something. Says something about what Grassy and crew have going on. And um, the expectation is now, you know, so high that you're disappointed when you don't make it to the final eight or the final four or the championship game. But uh keeping the faith is is what it's all about. We've already seen them make moves. There have been soccer players announced coming to the herd. So this is this is um very much a reload. You know, it's never going to be a rebuild. I don't think it'll ever be a rebuild as long as Grassy's here. It's always going to be a reload. So staff of the year merited. Uh but you know I think everybody wants the season Let's start the season already, you know, where everybody's everybody's ready to make another run. So we've got, uh, let's see, Sneatechi came back this year and everything. A um, little bit of changes. I can't remember who it was that left, but uh, Samoz is still here and Sneatechi's here. But, you know, top to bottom, we just got a really good staff. And I'm, I'm glad to see them get uh, get some of those accolades. All right, number four, Jaden Harrison has been named a finalist for the JET Award, which goes to the top return specialist in the country. Yep, I was waiting to see this. I had I followed just about all of the national awards, you know, and I didn't I couldn't find this one until I had to dig a little deeper. I saw a couple of accounts, and you know, the one I kept seeing didn't post since 2014, and I thought, all right, that's not it. But I finally mm-hmm. found the right one, and they still didn't announce their finalist when I was looking at it, but. Um, Brett McMurphy did, and I, I knew that this had to be a thing. It had to be. How can you be number one in uh, a couple of major categories, kick return, uh, yards average per return, number one, tied number one in touchdowns for kick return, um, number three in total kick return yards, all while only being able to field the 14th most opportunities. Right. That says you're pretty damn special right? Because you're not getting, it's not like you led the nation in total kick return opportunities. You know, you had the 14th fewest and still managed to lead in several huge categories and top three in three massive categories. Dude, I think he's got a legit shot at winning this thing. And I, I, I'm telling you, he's also got a legitimate shot to be an all American for, from a number of outlets. I think Jaden Harrison can be your I, you know, you don't know who does what. If they have a true kick returner as an All-American, he's got a shot to be that. If they just have a flex player, then he's got a legit shot to to be in those conversations too. But I think we might be staring down the barrel of uh, a really special bunch of accolades coming for Jaden Harrison. I'll tell you what, he's going so untalked about in herd circles. The conversations are always around other players, and and rightfully so. That we've got great players 
that are going to be playing their final game for the herd uh, or that may have already played their final game for the herd. We don't know, but Jaden Harrison needs to be talked about in, you know, those top, really top one, two, three guys of the season. Cause what he's done this year is so special. He has kept the herd in so many games and he has ignited the the crowd so many times. And he's the best. One of the best. And yeah, he's just one of the best in the country without a doubt. And boy, oh boy, I hope he stays with Marshall. I hope he stays. There's been no speculation otherwise, but you know, things like that, you're going to start getting calls. So he's a weapon we need to retain in Huntington. Folks should be more appreciative of what they saw from him and let him know that they appreciate appreciate him being with the herd. Yeah, so many times this year when it wasn't even a, a touchdown, it was we gave up a touchdown, we gave up a field goal, they kicked to Jaden, and he immediately puts us right back at midfield and got the crowd into it, got the bench into it, and just up the energy with his returns. So I really do think he's got a good shot. Yeah. All right. So number five, there is a new herd store that has opened and it's inside the Cam Henderson Center and it's open on basketball game days. Uh, if you go in up the steps to the outside to go into the main entrance on the uh, second floor, the ticket booth will be on your left and the herd store will be on your right. So have you had an opportunity to see it yet? I didn't go in and uh, shop for anything. Uh but I have been been past it, yes, on Saturday when I went to the, the uh, women's game. Mm. Next time you go to a game, you'll have to get some just some picks and you know tweet them out to you know quick shots of the interior just so folks can get a quick idea. But that's pretty cool, man. That's been needed for a long freaking time. I can't believe you know you haven't been able to to. They always had like the bookstore would have a table set up or something like that, mm -hmm. but they've yeah. needed they've needed a dedicated space that they don't have mm -hmm. to transport everything over there, or they might have put stuff in a closet. I don't know how they used to do it, but we. Let's put it that way. We needed a storefront in the cam um, that can be open, hopefully in an expanded role, you know, for volleyball and, and, and um, yeah. you know, women's and men's basketball and just anything right. that's played in the cam. Any event that's played in the yep. cam is an opportunity to sell merchandise. So we just needed it. Uh, but pretty cool nonetheless. I'll tell you why I didn't get any uh, photos is – I walked in, and as soon as I walked in, they started the national anthem after they scanned my ticket. So I stood at attention sure. there and everything, and it just totally left my mind. It was like, oh, now it's time to go to the seats, and sure. I just forgot. But, uh, no, it's good, and I imagine that this was just the – not soft opening because it's open, but I imagine there will be improvements as it goes with – more signage, more items going in there, that sure. sort of thing. But yeah. just having something there right now, better than having nothing. You're damn right it is better than having. And you know what? It's before Christmas. It's just, it makes sense, right? So mm -hmm. I love this. We, we have just needed it for so long. So, yeah. so long. So good move. Great. Actually, it's a great move. Now, um, it's just making it a little easier to buy some herd merch. Now, can we get some killer stuff in there? Like, I don't know what's in there. I haven't seen it. They may have this. I'm just saying, like, I want, you know, the legit Nike basketball jerseys. I want the legit, I want a great selection of hats. You know, I'm a hat guy. Obviously mm -hmm. I basically live in one and have for the last 30 years of my life. And uh, Marshall needs some better hat options. I will say that, but I would love to, to see a nice uh, and maybe some, maybe some, you know, exclusive items that are only at the cam. Like this is a cam exclusive to get you in there to go buy some right. stuff. But also yeah, like this, this here, you can uh, see if you're watching along on video, most of our people are, are listeners only, but I've got a uh, black long sleeve tee with uh, the Marshall script over top of a hoop. And in the netting, it says the herd way. Mm -hmm. It's just a nice, nice different shirt that, you know, I didn't have too many Marshall basketball shirts. I had uh, just, normal Marshall gear, but this is basketball specific. So it, I'm more likely to wear something like that to a, a basketball game. I would love for them to put like some of the team issued designs in there. I remember mm -hmm. even if they're, even if it's like a little bit older stuff, you know, because right. I remember I saw somebody and it might've been at the hoops and Huntington thing. They mm -hmm. had a shirt that said, you know, it's using that Marshall script. And it said like, 
uh, Marshall, like family. And it was the family mm -hmm. was in that Marshall. And I was like, man, that's a kick-ass shirt. I'd like to have something like that. But, you know, those things aren't generally available. You know, it's, it's team issued stuff. And, it, but I would love to see, uh, people will buy it. That's the thing. People will buy gear if it's like the legit stuff, you mm -hmm. know, if, if it's the, if it's the team issued apparel, people will buy it and the, people will buy, um, a replica Jersey if it's a true replica Jersey, you know? So we'll see where they go with this, but I always love adding merchandise or, uh, you know, merch outlets. So to make it easier to sell stuff. All right. Number seven, we, uh, are officially once you're past December the 4th into the transfer portal. We had yeah. a lot of, uh, entries that announced that they had intentions of going into the portal before, uh, December the 4th, but now we have people officially in there. Uh, I'm going to run through the names, but I also want to take an opportunity to say that over on thundercast.online, our website, we have an article that will constantly be updated with new additions to this transfer portal both ways. When someone comes here, we'll have that as well. So here's who I've got right now. And you can, when I get to the end of the list, say whatever. Uh, Thomas Lane, Tyshawn Hurst, C.K. Abobi, Joshua McTeer, Sean Salas, Maurice Jones Jr., Jabarik Hopkins, Trent Holler, Harshon Sackdiva, Jackson Marshall, Bo Blankenship, Caleb Horton, Charlie Veltry, Miles Bell, and Demarcus McElroy. A lot of guys. Right. Um, and some guys that we've gotten to know their families and it was, mm -hmm. and it was a little, you know, some, some little shocking, but it's the, it's the business of football. And I, mm -hmm. I heard no matter what your opinion of the transfer portal is, I think the, the, the best thing I heard it, uh, on ESPN the other day, somebody said, one of those analysts said, even though football is a team sport and it requires, a good team to win the business of football is individual. Right. And that, that makes sense to me. Um, and we heard Huff address that in the bowl announcement press conference as well. You know, he was kind of saying like, there haven't been uh, any surprises. You know, he even specifically talked about the conversation that he and Trent had. And, and he said that Trent said to him, it's been a dream of mine since I was, I think he said eight years old to play power five football. And he wants to see if he can do that. And, you know, when you have a dream from a little kid to now and, and you're in yeah. your, your last opportunity to realize that dream, don't you want to do it? I mean, because at some point, you know, you don't want to be, this might sound weird to people and, and they might go, yeah, yeah, whatever. But at some point in your life, you're going to be 60, 70 years old, whatever. And you'll go, you'll regret not taking that chance, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. so take the chance, take the chance. And if it, it doesn't work out, he said he left the door open for him to make a return to the herd. He'd be welcomed back. Um, but we, you know, we got to know the hollers and, and mm -hmm. they were, they're great people, man. Yeah, and delegated it, with them several times and uh, talked to them often. Uh, I did that article about them entering yep. the transfer portal as a family. Yep. It's, it sucks to see people like that potentially leave because they're great people. You know, and you just want to be around great people, but I get it, you know, uh, and, and, and Sean Salas too. I thought he would be a big part of the, uh, offense in 2024. Uh, but I understand, you know, may, we don't know what his reasoning is, you know, maybe, I mean, they're from Texas, man. And, and we've talked to Steve, his dad so many times, and he would always stop by the tailgate and great guy. And they would talk about, man, it's a 14 hour drive, yeah, 14 hours, you know, and, and they would be at every home game. And, uh, you know, maybe wants to try to be closer to home so that it's easier to travel. We don't know what the circumstances is, but, you know, we, we hate to see a player like that who is probably going to be pretty impactful for the herd leave as well. But we heard Huff talk about a lot of these guys that enter the portal are guys that are walk-ons and they're looking mm -hmm. for a scholarship opportunity because they say, coach, I want to be here. But we, you know, this, the financial strain is, big we know how much college costs you know and these guys pay for all that they're paying for their meals they're paying for their books and every other fee just like every other student and they're also having to be a athlete with with mm -hmm. weight sessions and treatment and practice and tutoring and everything yeah you know so 
to, to remove that financial burden, that's a big deal. You know, so I don't I don't fault these guys for going into the portal and trying to see if there's an opportunity out there for them. And but, here's another thing. And uh, go, I you finish. I, I didn't know. I was going to say, all I'm going to say is I'm going to constantly remind people what our buddy Moff says about the portal. The portal giveth and the portal taketh away. It's a two way street. People will leave and new players will come in. And we've had pretty good, um, a pretty good track record since Huff's been here of transfer players that have come in and been really big contributors. Yeah. So that's why I always look at it as an opportunity to upgrade a position or a roster spot. Not mm -hmm. necessarily this guy's better than that guy, but it's a spot that's open. So how can you mm -hmm. upgrade with that open spot, no matter what unit or position group he goes in? Uh, so look at it that way. You know, it, you have an opportunity to upgrade. Does it always work out? No, it does not always work out. But, We've had some very impactful players come in from the portal. Think of guys like Damian Barber and Gibby mm -hmm. and and Le Labor for crying out loud. Yeah. He's a portal guy. So mm -hmm. just sit back and see how it all plays out. But for now, you know, all you can do is wish these guys the best. I wish I hope Trent Holler gets that power five off. And I hope that he goes to that next stop. And I hope he makes a starting role. And I hope that he dominates because he's a great guy and he deserves it. And he worked hard for the herd and helped us get a lot of wins. I hope Sean Salas gets to the place that he needs to be to to really flourish because he's a great great kid they're a great family you know the hurt fan in me hates it because i wanted him here on our team helping us win but the guy in me is like man you do what you got to do i dig it go do what you need to do just my two cents now uh i'm not saying these specific players when i say this or pointing fingers at anybody but it is important to remember that here and other schools that there are also conversations that the coach has with players and just says, you do not have a starting role at this time. You don't have a role where you're going to get into the game at this time. I mean, these are difficult conversations and it is up to the, the athlete. A lot of them decide they want to move on. You know, it's a kind of an exit interview, I guess you would say, or year end interview. Sure. And, and that is one of the things that you have to, to consider here. Yeah, it is and it, because it happened last year and we heard him talk about that. You know, he said last year that they, up to that point, they had only lost two guys in the portal uh, over the first two years he had been there that they had not wanted to lose or had not expected to lose, right? Mm -hmm. And and you're right, that's part of it. Now, you're not going to go on to social media and be like, these guys aren't, you know, welcomed here anymore, or there, right. there's no need for them here anymore. It's, yeah. it's you always err to the side of allowing the player to say, I am entering the portal. Recruitment mm -hmm. is open. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the right thing to do. You know, it'd just yeah. be like, if you got fired from your job, they're not going to go out and be like, Russ living good is fired. He's never working here again. You know, you're well, going to have the not opportunity too fast. Uh, I'd say that might be on the table. I don't you know. Have I'd, the have, opportunity I'd have to ask him to go out and say, you know, uh, it's time for a new chapter. I'm looking for mm -hmm. my next opportunity, right? That's just the right thing to do. So, you know, keep that in it. Keep that in mind here before you go running off the cliff. But I'll tell you what, if you want to keep track of it, like you said, thundercast.online, we're tracking all of the uh, guys that leave the program and guys that come into the program. So it's not mm -hmm. just a one way street. But anyway, portal season yeah. is wide open. And don't expect uh, here in the next week that we're just going to have a huge influx, you know. So, be prepared that you're going to see a lot more people leave after the bowl game. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got people leaving right now before the bowl game. Uh, but be prepared. You're going to see some more names leaving before you see a lot more coming back in. But once the new year starts, you're going to see a lot more people coming back in. Yeah. And you may see a couple come in, you know, with coaching mm -hmm. changes and coaching hires. You may see that. But, you know, it's a window. It's a couple of a week window that you get to enter and, and you know, make some commitments. You've got early signing day. Then that portal window will close. Then you'll have to get through national signing day again. And then there will be another portal window after spring practice, just like always. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. always see a lot of movement, you know, a couple of months apart. But these next four months or whatever will be very busy as far as recruiting, portal signings, you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, I just saw today that, 500 over a thousand people went in officially in the first day of the portal and ha a half of those were scholarship athletes guys that had a scholarship that are choosing to see if there's a 
better or different opportunity out there for them. And that that's a that to me is what is a gamble. You know, if you're if you're a walk on guy and you don't have a scholarship, what do you have to lose? You know, because you can walk on somewhere else, you know. Yeah. But if you have a scholarship, man, that's really a gamble. And and every year guys go in thinking they're going to have another opportunity and they don't get it. You know, so I, I don't have a problem with guys betting on themselves. You should. Nobody's going to bet on you. You should bet on yourself. Uh, but just be calculated, be very smart, and you also have to be a little bit lucky, you know. But please, by all means, go do what is best for you and your family. Um, it's just a very tumultuous time, the portal sessions. Our eighth and final thing of this week is about the bowl game, and it is going to be the Scooters Coffee Bowl in Frisco, Texas, Tuesday uh, the 19th. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tuesday the 19th at 9 p.m. Yeah. So before we bleed this over into our feature segment to discuss this bowl, this is my annual reminder to let everyone know that even Brett McMurphy and the ones that everyone <laughs> freaks out over and says, here's exactly where we're going. Oh, we're, we're going to be playing in the ice bowl in Greenland. You know, uh, those are drastically no one, no one that I ever saw during the entire process picked us to be playing in the Frisco bowl. I never yeah. saw it anywhere. Me neither. Last, last minute, boom, we're playing in Frisco. So don't put stock in these when they change them three days a week. And all that's doing is they're getting more clicks and engagement because they have a drastically different uh, bowl projection list than they did two days prior. So we're going to Frisco. The only thing that I hate about this is I now will not get to go to the game because of our schedules. Everything else I'm fine with it. Yeah. Uh, real quick, l- l- this will, the eighth thing is now transitioning into the featured story, which is, of course, the bowl game announcement. So let me give the actual stats. You were pretty right, not stats, but the, the, the info on the game. You're right about most of it. Scooters Coffee, Frisco Bowl, Toyota Stadium in Frisco, Texas. Um, what did I say? You got that right. I'm just oh, okay. saying, I just, I'm just, going through my spiel december 19th also right 9 p.m eastern game will be on espn uh the big plus for that is the uh it's the only game on the uh 19th mm-hmm. so yeah. if you want to watch football college football you're going to be watching the herd play the road runners um i i mm, how do i say this without seeming like a dark cloud but outside of going to idaho <laughs> this would have been like the least desirable location. And it's for the reason you said, because far fewer people will make the trip to Frisco, Texas, than maybe Charlotte or Myrtle beach or anywhere mm-hmm. in Florida yeah. with easier flights. So mm-hmm. that part sucks, but it's better than sitting at home. Before you go on, let me just mention, I looked into flights and I still can't go because of my schedule with the three kids and them being in school and all the stuff. From Cincinnati to Dallas, it's a short drive up to Cincinnati, and it was a hundred and seventeen dollars round trip to oh, go to cute. Dallas. That's really so cheap. anyone listening, anyone watching that wants to do that, you can fly there the day of the game, as best I can remember, and still have hours and hours before the uh, kickoff to get from Dallas to Frisco, which is 45 minutes or something like that. It's not very far. Um, So anyone listening and wants to do that, look into it. Just look for flights. I'm sure Columbus is probably going to have some cheap flights. They may have them out of Lexington. I don't know. Huntington wasn't that cheap at all, obviously, but uh, there are options around if people do not want to drive that far and are looking for a way to get to the game. Yeah, I didn't look at that. You know, I just assumed like, ah, going to Texas is it's it's still even if the flights are cheap. You know, being that close to Christmas, folks are going to be like, eh, logistically, I don't know if I want to do it. Where you know, you can make a day trip out of Charlotte. You know, you, you, but again, um, it's going to be the only game on. So for your brand, that's good. You know, uh, Marshall's of course playing UTSA, former Conference USA foe UTSA. They had a really good year. They were eight and four on the season and seven and one in the American, only losing the final week of the season in conference play to Tulane. 
Uh, they were if they win that game, they would have been in the uh, American Championship game, I believe. So this is a really good team. They're led by some uh, premier seniors that have been around for a long time, including they've got ten seniors listed on the roster. By the way, including quarterback Frank Harris, he's been there forever, and he's a highly productive quarterback. Uh, and wide receiver uh, Joshua Cephas, who's also highly productive. We'll dig more into these players, and st of course, as the game gets closer and we do a bowl game preview because <laughs> it's just too early to do that right now. There could be opt-outs and so much other stuff. To, it just would not behoove us to put in any info out there that may not remotely be accurate um, right. a couple of you know, a week or so from now. Uh, there, of course, Roadrunners are head coached by Jeff Trailer. He's been very, very successful in San Antonio. You always hear his name tossed around for Power 5 openings. Most recently, of course, he was talked talked tossed around and I believe even interviewed for the Texas A&M opening. Uh, he's 8-4 and four this year, but the past two years, he's won 11-3 and three and 12-2. and two. I mean, he's good, and that team's is pretty good. Uh, the only other thing you really got to worry about mainly is that they are going to travel because it's not mm -hmm. that far of a drive from San Antonio to Frisco. Uh, it's much easier for them to get there than it is for the herd to get there. And San Antonio is a big population center. They have a big fan base now that has grown and grown and grown. You can expect them to travel to the Frisco Bowl. Tickets uh, are on herdzone.com. They range between $55 and $65, depending on where you want to sit, like right at the $50, $65. Bucks. A couple of sections over, it drops down to $55 bucks plus fees. I think you can get two tickets in that $55 range after fees for right around $150. Bucks. So something to consider. Um, and, you know, if you go through Herdzone, it's going to direct you to a third party ticket site so you might as well go through herd zone it's not like you're gonna you know have any substantial savings uh by going somewhere else so you might as well directly benefit the herd so we're if you can't go we don't have any info right now on donation tickets or anything like that if you'd still like to support the herd but can't make the trip but uh, be on the lookout for that that's usually a thing that that is um you know, these bowls partner with a local charity or, or veterans organization or something like that to send people to games. So um, that's always something to take part in if you can. But for now, it's UTSA and the herd <laughs> is back in Frisco, Texas, uh, which was, of course, the site of the uh, basketball championships, Conference USA basketball championships. No word officially, Russ, if the Conference USA curtain is going to make an appearance at the bowl game. I guess we'll have to see uh, if that's a thing. But, you know, we're going back to the, its old stomping grounds. Maybe the curtain will be honored at halftime. I don't really know. I did look here. Uh, tickets have gone up slightly over the last two days, but still $142 round trip from uh, Cincinnati and in the same ballpark from Lexington. So just keep that in mind. All right, take us around the herd if you got nothing else on the Scooters Coffee Frisco Bowl for right now. I don't. We're going around the herd, and keep in mind for the Around the Herd segment, anyone listening or watching out there and knows of anyone that wants to be the sponsor of that, you or your business can help us take it around the herd. Starting off with baseball, we picked up a transfer from Lenny Washington, former St. Joe pitcher right here in Huntington. He spent the last three years at Gardner-Webb. Tell you what, cool story about this. Um, I remember when Lenny played Little League because my son played Little League uh, with and against, or more so against, Lenny. So it's pretty cool, man. You get uh, uh, a, a local kid back to play for the herd. I know folks love mm -hmm. to um, to have the locals come home and play for the herd, and he was a really, really good player at Huntington St. Joe. Um, and um, I'm glad he's back. That was cool. That came across the timeline, and I showed that to my wife, and I was like, hey, look, do you remember him? And she was kind of like, yeah, yeah, um, pretty cool. You know, uh, you know, my son took a different route. He, he kind of gave up athletics and stuff, and, of course, he's, um, he's uh, in the military, but uh, I remember those little league games, and, and uh, Lenny was always really good young then, back then, of course. That's why you turn into a Division I uh, prospect. So glad to have him back. Welcome to the herd, Lenny. Yeah, um, it just seems like a, a great time, too, to come in. And, you know, he's been in this area, and they have not had a, a stadium to go watch games as a kid and then as a youth and then as a young adult. And mm -hmm. 
and all that. And now he's coming back and will be part of, from his hometown area, part of the very first game in that stadium. Super yep. cool. Yeah. Uh, swimming and diving. Somehow we missed this last week. I say we, it was me. Uh, miss putting this on here as a preview, but Jenna Bopp competed at the 2023 Toyota U.S. Open on Friday and Sunday of last week. She was just the fourth student athlete in program history to do that. Yeah, super cool. I'm telling you, any any time you're every week, swim and dive. We got something. We got something. Anytime, good. anytime you're saying fourth student athlete ever. You know, notice it didn't say female. It said fourth student athlete. So male, female. Uh, At one time we had male swim and dive back. I think it was decades and decades ago, but uh, I think that's what it, what it was. But uh, if I'm wrong about that, somebody can let me know. Hmm. Uh, But we talked about this with going to nationals with Abby Herring, you know, Hmm. in running. And now here's, uh, Jenna Bopp going to the U S open. I mean, th- these are just super, super cool yeah. uh, to make it that far and, and to be invited. And yes, you can go. So I don't care what the placement ended up being a, or anything that, you know, wasn't top five, wasn't top one, you know, didn't win that sort of thing, making it there alone for both of those things and others. Think of the hundreds and thousands of uh, athletes every year that don't get to participate in such a thing just think about these schools that hang their hat on their swimming and diving program yeah. you know like that's what we're known for you know it's a it's mm-hmm. a lot of like uh pack 12 schools mm-hmm. you know because yeah. they churn out olympians it's, it's schools like michigan churn out olympians in the pool you know and uh, schools like florida turn churn out olympians and we're trying to break into that um, echelon, you know, and it, it, it doesn't happen overnight, man. Obviously, if you're the fourth uh, athlete ever from Marshall to do that, it says it's rarefied air here. And I think we would all agree that it is. But when it happens, like celebrate the shit out of it, man, because it's a big deal. You know, I'm not telling you you have to go to every swim and dive competition. But dang, you could at least hit the retweet button or say, that's awesome or great job when the swim and dive account says that, you know, it is so it costs you nothing to show some support and just give a go herd to coach Walsh and this team. And specifically Jenna Bop, you know, like celebrate him. You know, we love our football team and our men's and women's basketball team and our softball team and, and uh, our baseball team. But dang, you can love the volleyball team and the swim and dive team and, you know, golf and every cross country and track just as much. A retweet means a lot to the engagement of that uh, account. It helps get those eyes out there to other herd fans that follow you that might not see it. It's it's free. Just do it. You know, it's so cool. Well, you know, when you were talking about that, I started thinking about their championship fund and and it made me think about, you know, on day of giving how money mm-hmm. went there. And it reminded me, I skipped a number when we were going over the things on five things. Day of giving was one mm-hmm. of the ones I was going to talk about. So just briefly, we had over one hundred and five thousand dollars. That number continued to go the day that they announced day of giving. It was one hundred and three thousand well, the next day uh, after the article came out, when you click the link, it was over 105000 So it has continued to trickle up. That is great considering they had a goal of 25000 amongst all sports. Yep. So um, just keep in mind when, when something like this happens, and Herd Zone has been doing a great job of putting a link in the article, when something happens, they'll say, In honor of this, if you'd like to contribute to the uh, championship fund, do it here. If everyone that read that article just threw in a dollar, you Mm -hmm. know, and clicked that link and did that, and 50 people read it, every time they did that, $50 go into that sport. Those add up, especially in those smaller uh, revenue, uh, or not revenue, but the smaller uh, championship fund uh, sports, you know, that can be game changing for them. Yeah, sure can. You know, we, we, uh, we talked about that. Remember last year with, uh, 
then softball coach Megan Smith Lyon, she talked about yeah. how that uh, fun helps them get things that they need. She's like, we're not out of here buying, you know, whatever we feel like. It's like equipment that we need, you know, or something, yeah. uh, something that is really useful to help us win. And, you know, these, these Olympic sports by and large, um, have the smallest budgets, right? It doesn't take a bajillion dollars to run a golf program. So if they get an extra 500 bucks, they're going to put that to good use, you know? So think about that, but, uh, back on track with, you know, Jenna Bopp and Ian Walsh and, and the swim and dive program every week over the past seemingly month, at least we've had something really positive about swim mm -hmm. and dive. And, um, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to keep saying it, man. We were told we're, we're onto something here. You know, we're, we're mm -hmm. trying to go to another level here and it looks like they are, you know, mm -hmm. so just a retweet or a like, man, it's nothing. It costs nothing to do that. Just, just hit it and help them get the word out to what they're doing to the rest of the herd fans that may follow you. Next up we have track and field and the Marshall opener is this Friday facility will open at 4 30 PM and the events will be run from 5 30 PM to around 9 PM. Cool. So, I had lost so track in of the that. area. If you're in the area, go over and watch uh, at the Chris Klein indoor athletic complex, go over and uh, watch them kick off the year. I had totally forgotten that that was coming. And if I did it, I guarantee you hundreds of hundred upon hundreds of herd fans did as well. Uh, so it's a great opportunity just to get out and support a, a, a another program that's been doing some really great things over the past two years or more. So, you know, it, it just maybe you'll see the 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 greatest maybe you'll see the great out there too you know so uh, you have an opportunity to lay eyes on some uh, cross country royalty uh, for herd athletics and some other huge performers that are back still competing uh, just get out there if you can man be a cool thing for the kiddos to see you know easily approachable athletes it's always cool for kiddos to get around herd athletes no matter what sport they play and just take a photo and and you know our athletes appreciate that too. You know, they, they appreciate that they there are fans turning out to see them. You know, mm -hmm. this is the type of thing, like if I was in Huntington, I would do because, you know, what's it an hour out of my day, a couple hours out of my day to just go hang out and have a good time. And then, you know, when it's time to go, you go. But, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes of just showing up, being there, cheering goes a long mm -hmm. way. Uh, men's soccer, you mentioned earlier, we reload, we don't, uh, do anything else. And we are already on that reload bandwagon here. We picked up a transfer from Lineker Rodriguez dos Santos, uh, who was the leading scorer for Memphis and maybe in the entire in the AAC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, don't know who's uh, going to be coming back officially from last year's team yet, but, uh, adding him has to help quite a bit. All right. So, uh, men's basketball, we lost at home to Miami, Ohio, Saturday, 79 to 74. Uh, we host Duquesne on Wednesday at 7 PM and then we'll travel to Ohio on Saturday at 4 PM. Uh, it has been no sugar coating here. It has been a rough way to go. Uh, so far this early in the season for the men's basketball squad yeah. and coach Dan Tony's comments uh, after this game kind of reflected his frustration uh, with that. Yeah. First thing, let me ask you something. Uh, I had a glitch there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, and you know, some people I tweeted this when he said what he said, we're not a very good team right now or whatever. And people have been saying that. So, Mm -hmm. I don't know why people would pretend to be angry that Dan would say that because he's the yeah. guy in charge. You would expect him to lead the way of being critical of his own team, right? Well, well, full pause here. We've got some people, and and I'm I'm saying no, no one specifically comes to mind, but some people have said, "I want Coach Huff or any coach to stand up and take responsibility and say." the problem starts with me and we're not very good right now and admit it and don't give us any kind of fluff or any kind of uh, pomp and circumstance or any kind of spin. They want 
someone Truth. to stay, stand up and do that. Yeah. And then you have a coach do exactly what they said. And then some people get on there and say, I can't believe he would say that. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it, I don't know what we're doing when we're talking out of both sides of our mouths to do that. Either we want that and think that that's an admirable trait, or we think, well, this guy ought to be ran out of town, which is it. But, uh, I, I think that it is he, he called out a specific player and said that he needs to do more, uh, you know, to make it onto the court. Uh, he called out himself and said, you know, I don't like a lot of what's going on right now. And a lot of that is with me. So he recognizes that right now they do not have the record that he expected and they're not playing the way that they need to play. So yeah. I, yeah. right now they've, they see problems and they're going to try to correct them. Yeah, I know. And, but in the meantime, it's it's frustrating. We knew it was going to be more of a rebuild, you know, based mm -hmm. on what we lost. Because we just lost a lot of production. A yeah. lot. On both ends of the floor, we lost a lot of production. But still, you expect um, enough to still be there that you can be competitive in, in games. And, and, yeah, we're not getting blown out by – 20 every game but you have to be able to beat teams like miami of ohio on your own floor you got to be able to do that you know i know these guys want to want to win that goes without saying you know this is not an indictment of our players or our players effort or anything like that it's no fans want to come out to games like that and lose Right. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to get blown out by Kentucky, which sucks because uh, they just got beat on their home floor, you know, a couple of games later by a team that's also on our schedule, UNC Wilmington. But that notwithstanding, men's basketball is not living up to the standard right now. Yeah, <laughs> they're not. And there's no way around it. Uh, and I don't know what the answer is because I'm not a basketball coach, but mm -hmm. I do know from a fan standpoint, it sucks to continually be like, Another loss, another loss, another loss, right? Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to experience that. And especially, I think it gets magnified a little bit because um, when you're when you become out of contention for a football championship, people turn to basketball and go, well, we got a new season. Let's make some noise. And to have the basketball team not come off and get off to a fast start, uh, it's it's just pushing some of those fans like further into a hole that they don't want to be in, you know, like, God, can we right. get anything good to go along? Well, you know what? That's why maybe you should pay attention to things like swim and dive. Maybe you should pay attention to things like track and field because those are positive things that help your fandom. You know, when, when the things you really want to be successful aren't as successful as you'd want them to be, um, those Olympic sports programs help. A lot of momentum around baseball, a lot of momentum around softball, right? A lot of momentum around uh, swim and dive and, and track and field, you know. But um, I want the men's basketball team to win too. It sucks when oh, you're yeah. way down yeah. there like 260 or something in the net. That ain't going to get it done, you know. That is not going to get it done. When you see conference mates that are in the top 25, when you see conference yeah. mates that are knocking off big programs in their home, and we are not doing that. It is not – out of the realm of, of uh, fans to be like, why can't we win here? You know, yeah. they do it there. Why can't we do it here? It's yeah. a valid question. It's a valid point, right? It's not calling anybody out. It's like, we want to win too. Why can't we? What is keeping that from happening? So all we can hope for is, you know, a turnaround. We've got a Wednesday game against Duquesne that's at the cam. Then we're going to have to travel uh, up to Athens to play Ohio U, a place that's always pretty tough for the herd to play. But better, they just got to start winning. That cures yeah. all. That <laughs> cures all. It does. It does. And here is a situation where we can talk just about that. Women's basketball. Yeah. Lost at Wright State last Monday, 89 to 78. Lost at Moorhead State on Thursday, 67 to 64. Beat Florida at home on Saturday, 91 to 88. They go on to host Salem on Monday at 6 p.m. Um, that is one of those winning cures all because you had two different road losses there. And uh, you're like, well, you know, we're losing, we're losing, we're losing. 
oh, and then we knock off Florida. Yeah, I was at that game. Uh, this was not a situation where our team got lucky. Florida didn't play well. Florida put up 88 points. That's right. Uh, you know, uh, Florida, Florida played great. So did we. And we were without leading scorer, Rochelle Scott. Yeah. Was not at the game. And we beat them 91 to 88. And we did so convincingly. So I'd like to point out a couple of things. Leading into this game, uh, Florida was a 16 and a half point favorite. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 16 and a half points. The over under, according to ESPN, was 139 and a half, and the score ended up being 91 to 88. 100 and freaking 80 points basically scored in that one, and uh, 40 points over what was projected. And yeah. the difference in this one was what we kept saying in some of those losses those three pointers, more of those fell. They were yeah. around 40% from behind the arc. Uh, in this one against Florida. And Florida shot really well, too. They hit 33% of their threes, of their threes. I mean, they actually outshot the herd from a total field goal standpoint, uh, nearly hitting 45%. The, the herd was just over 42. So it was neck and neck. And you're right, they were in it. And Florida had a lead at halftime. They had a lead in the third. They had a lead. You know, the herd just kept fighting, kept fighting. It's a scrappy team that they couldn't shake. And, and it's like we say in football a lot. If you give yourself a chance to be around mm -hmm. at the end of the game, then you have a chance to win the game, and that's exactly what happened. The herd scrapped and clawed and stayed in the game and was able to outpace the Gators in the fourth to win the game late. In that one, Russ, you, you mentioned we're without Rashala Scott, and I tell you what, listen to these point totals, four big outputs offensively leading the way Abby Beeman having a great season for the herd just missed another triple double. She is killing it for the herd this year. Uh, 24 I mentioned to go along with 11 assists and she uh, had eight boards right there to get that triple double next uh, was Brianna Campbell had 19 then followed by Aislinn Hayes 18 and then Mahogany Matthews 13 couple more well, one more score, uh, Mays had eight, and then not much bench scoring, just what's it, six, nine total points off the bench. So those starters really rose to the occasion, gave Coach Kim her first signature win in her career with the Herd and signature win at the Cam. I tell you what, this is where it was disappointing for me. We gave tickets away to that game. We tried to give tickets away to that game, and I expected that there would be a flurry of people that wanted to go and there was not, and that was disappointing. This was a marquee opponent at the Cam Henderson Center. On a Saturday, everything lined up for two people to go check that game out, and uh, not, a, not enough people said, yeah, man, I want to go see that. Well, I hope you do now because uh, a little over 1,100 people was the announced attendance to this game. That should have been easily triple or quadruple for that one, easily, but it wasn't. So congratulations to Coach Ken. Congratulations to the herd, man. They went out and proved they could be a team to reckon with this season. It will mm -hmm. be up and down. It will be up and down. We know that. Yep. But once we get into conference play, they might have enough stuff going right and enough momentum built. And if the shots are falling, they can beat anybody. That's right. And uh, I just have to say that the the – some of these games you normally think of that something has to go wrong for the other team or whatever. They were getting very favorable calls from the refs. They were having a very good shooting night. They got a lot of steals and points off the fast break. They were, they had a six foot six player and they were getting a lot of rebounds. It was just Marshall playing Marshall basketball, Kim Caldwell basketball and I am pumped for what we can do the rest of the year. <laughs> I am the here for it. <laughs> I'm here for it. I mean, you know, I, that wasn't the only game I've been to so far this year. You know, I, I think they've had two home games. I've been to two home games, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I plan to go as often as I can. And the crowd that was there was electric. I will say for everyone that was there, I know that it's easy to spread out because you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, 5,000 to 7,000 people trying to be in there. But if you would cluster together closer, we would be that much louder and that much more of a, uh, uh, a sixth man on the court, you know, uh, when they're trying to, uh, 
concentrate when they're trying to run their offense, when they're trying to just the, the intimidation factor of, of everyone being there loud. It was a good crowd, but it could have been a lot better. And if we sit closer and are loud when Ben Westfall, who does an amazing job announcing, he was trying to get the crowd into it a couple times too. You know, listen to Ben. And let's get uh, let's get rowdy and make that an environment that no one wants to come in and play for, especially yeah. when it comes to conference play. No doubt. You got anything else? That's it for around the herd. So I just want to say that whether you see us at the Joan, whether you see us at the Cam, or whether you see us someone going down to the Frisco Bowl because <laughs> I can't go now. But wherever you see us, we're going to be saying go herd. Go Herd, it's the Thundercast. We'll come back soon here with some recruiting updates, some portal news, coaching hires, all the good stuff, and a Scooter's Coffee Frisco Bowl preview. We'll see you later.